David Colander and Richard Holt and I have a, a series of several books and uh, a whole bunch of papers and we're still uh, doing these things. Studying kind of where is economics going and, and, and what's the nature of economics. Uh, and some of this work has created some backlash. I'm Barclay Rosser, or J. Barclay Rosser Jr., and I'm at James Madison University, uh, editor of the Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization for a decade, and I'm currently editing a new journal, The Review of Behavioral Economics. You have sort of three terms. You have orthodox, mainstream, and heterodox. And to some degree, we were inspired by seeing, being unhappy with mostly heterodox econ economists who would talk about mainstream orthodoxy or mainstream orthodox neoclassical economics, kind of lumping these things together. So it's like heterodox versus this homogeneous mainstream orthodox. And we sort of decided that things are a little more complicated. So we decided there's sort of two aspects here. So one is an intellectual aspect and one's a sociological aspect. Orthodoxy is really an intellectual category. So this is when we think about n standard neoclassical economics, uh, equilibrium and um, individual maximizing and rationality. Uh, these are aspects of this sort of Chicago school will be the sort of supreme of this, but it's you know, and much of the rest of the profession as well. Uh, this is orthodoxy, intellectual orthodoxy. The mainstream though is really a sociological category. It's, it's the people who are in charge. Now some of the people who are in charge are orthodox. But a lot of the people in charge really don't uh, support orthodox uh, ideas. They're, they're, they're non-orthodox intellectually, but they're somehow they're, you know, they're at MIT and they're at Harvard and they're at Berkeley and Stanford and these places. We think about somebody like George Akerlof and so, so people who are doing behavioral economics or Vernon Smith doing experimental economics. I mean, so if, if people are very respected and uh, they're, they're leaders of the discipline, but their, their ideas are not, uh, they're not standard neoclassical. They're not orthodox. Um, but they're very influential. Um, heterodoxy, however, combines the both. So it is both intellectual and sociological. So people who are sort of self-styled heterodox uh, are both certainly intellectually non-orthodox, but also sort of, they're not in, they're not in charge. They're sociologically cast. And, and this has led to, of course, a lot of unhappiness. But I will also note over time that some of this whole emergence of, you might say, the sort of non-orthodox mainstream, that that's something that's happened over the last couple of decades. Uh, the sort of emergence of these sort of alternative ideas, which we are very much encouraging, that's been more in the last couple of decades and it's become more important. But I, I think a lot, of, a lot of heterodox economists sort of are unhappy with thinking about that. They prefer to kind of have this duality between the mainstream orthodox and the heterodox. And the world's more complicated, if not complex. The standard neoclassical model just usually assumes homogeneous agents, especially at least at the macro level. Now, of course, microeconomics has always had individuals have their own preferences, but usually you don't have these sort of interactions, sort of people's preferences are on well, what I'm consuming and that's it. And you don't really worry about what other people are thinking or what other people relate to. So uh, these interactions allow for nonlinear dynamics and feedbacks that don't happen in standard models. And, and complexity economics is sort of a major theme of my research that cuts through a lot of different areas. Modern econophysicists actually claim that it's physicists doing economics, but uh, there are also uh, a lot of economists working with some of these physicists and trying to kind of get a, a, a middle ground. I mean, there's a very long history, of course, of physics influence on, on economics and economic theory. If you go back, and Paul Samuelson, uh, many of his ideas that are very standard were drawn from physics. People like Philip Morawski have written books about this sort of thing. But this is a newer, uh, this is a newer uh, set of ideas. So one of the big themes has to do with uh, uh, probability distributions. So let's say in financial economics and also in income distributions, standard economists think about Gaussian normal distributions. Uh, but we know uh, that uh, wealth distributions and capital income distributions and also financial market return distributions, these are not unrelated issues, uh, have what are called uh, power law distributions. So they have fat tails, they have greater extremes. So you have great extremes of wealth, you have great extremes of financial market outcomes going up and down and with speculative bubbles and bursts. And uh, the econophysicists, they, they are much more willing to use these kinds of distributions, these kinds of models. It's really quite amazing. I mean, you can pick up graduate textbooks by, like, say, John Cochran or somebody. Uh, very advanced graduate textbooks, and hundreds of pages long. And you will find no mention of, 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 of leptokurtotic or fat tail distributions. They're using these Gaussian normal distributions, which simply don't fit reality. So the econo some of the econophysicists are coming in and saying, you know, you need to look at facts. You need to be more scientific. Of course, some of the economists come back and say, well, but you need some economic theory. You have no economic theory. 
you're just you know, making things up here. But uh, again, the account of physics models also tend to involve nonlinear feedbacks, nonlinear dynamics. Uh, there's a close link with sort of the broader complexity literature. A lot of the, some of the important account of physicists like Dwayne Farmer, who's at the Santa Fe Institute, or used to be, you know, they were originally coming out of doing chaos theory and all kinds of nonlinear dynamics and now doing all kinds of account of physics uh, models and so on. Some behavioral economics is, is I mean, it's getting more recognized. We've had a couple of Nobel Prizes. I mean, Thaler just got the Nobel Prize, and we've had a few others. But uh, people are taking it more and more seriously. I mean, I think one of the things that this is one of those areas where a lot of people realize that, you know, the world really is, how do people actually behave in economics? Behavioral economics tells you, because behavioral economics is they don't always follow what economic theory says. They don't follow, you know, the neoclassical, individual, rationalistic kinds of models. We're back to this stuff that... Uh, uh, Colander and, and, and Holt and I were talking about. So people behave in all sorts of ways, and you know, it may or may not be rational, but you have to, if you want to understand how the economy works, what's going on, you have to actually look at how people behave, and people do the darndest things, as the old television show used to say. So.